Hi guys, today we will continue last week's subject, Anatoly Dyatlov. We will focus on the next chapter in his long and interesting history. After HBO's Chernobyl, Dyatlov has begun to be well known and recognized around the world. As a historical figure, of course, because he died in 1995, nine and a half years after the disaster, at the age of 64. However, he undoubtedly played an essential part in the whole Chernobyl event, his somewhat tragic character in this terrible story. The last episode was dedicated to Dyatlov's early life, education and the beginning of his career. If you'd like to hear what his co-workers said about him, check out the previous episode. You can find the link in the upper right corner. Save it for later and watch this episode until the end. So. Let's start with the Atlov's story, part 2. Chapter 4. The Day of the Disaster Having in mind how hard early childhood he had, and how hard the Atlov worked to earn his place in the USSR nuclear physics arena, it's sad to say that we are getting to the most important part of his life, the Chernobyl disaster. On the fatal night of April 26th, 1986, Anatoly was on duty at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. It wasn't really anything unusual, as today we could call him a workaholic. Sometimes he worked for weeks without taking any day off. As several times before, he was in charge of a safety test that was necessary to confirm the reactor's operational readiness officially. As you may know, that was reactor number 4. And as you may also know, this so-called routine test didn't go as planned. As a result, the reactor exploded and released huge amounts of radioactive particles into the air. What exactly happened? There are many versions, but a lot of them contain from a small portion to almost only propaganda, misinformation or misinterpretation of the facts. At first, before the test was started, Dyatlov ordered a power reduction of the reactor to reach the limit of 200 megawatts. This was a lot below what the test's manual said. The limit there was 700 megawatts. This we know for sure, but it wasn't anything out of ordinary as Dyatlov didn't purposely danger the test. He knew what he could aim at. It was risky, but he concluded that it was safe enough. The reason behind this decision is unclear even today. One of the assumptions was that the test wasn't planned for this particular day and because of that, the reactor wasn't prepared accordingly to the plan, so Dyatlov had to improvise. Maybe you weren't aware that Dyatlov wrote a book about his part in the disaster. He recalled in it that the work was going pretty much as usual, so what was going to happen would later completely surprise the staff, including himself. In the meantime, the reactor stalled, which resulted in xenon poisoning. The power dropped to the level of 30 megawatts. Xenon poisoning is a state of the reactor when you can't safely increase the power quickly. There were specific instructions on what to do in such situations. There should be a safety measures taken to ensure the gas is burned out. Before that, it was dangerous to increase the power. To describe it better, imagine trying to drive a car which has a manual gearbox. When the engine starts, you begin with the first gear, then move to the next one as the speed increases, and so on. Trying to quickly raise power in a nuclear reactor with xenon poisoning is like trying to start driving with the fifth gear but with the possibility of the engine failing completely and being useless afterwards. We also have to remember that Dyatlov was not alone in the control room of a reactor number 4 in Chernobyl nuclear power plant on April 26, 1986. He was a supervisor, not a person who actually manned the advanced reactor equipment. The operators could use the manual to check what to do, as shown in the HBO's miniseries, but it's actually true that those instructions were either contradictory or unclear. Not that they needed to exactly, as the operators weren't complete newbies. They had some useful experience in the field of their work. Dyatlov recalled that he saw the power was at about 50 to 70 megawatts, and between quick talk with Akimov, the latter said that the power dropped even more, to 30 megawatts. This itself didn't mean any dire consequences just by happening. As Dyatlov said, there are no units that didn't suffer from power decreases, and called the situation trivial. He did admit that he didn't pay much attention to it, instead he allowed the power to be increased and walked away from the panel. 
To do so, the operators, including Akimov, had to manually control many systems that usually worked as a automated ones. They listened to Dyatlov and started to increase the power. They had to change a lot of functions in the overall safety system. Due to many different details, in one moment, the power rose quicker than the operators anticipated. They were stunned, but continued to react accordingly, manually controlling the system. The energy surge not only didn't stop at a safe level, but exceeded it enormously. Because of the vicious circle of different elements, systems and processes inside the reactor, the power rose probably to over 30,000 megawatts, as was shown in the simulations. The tragedy didn't happen yet. It was a very difficult situation, of course, but the final decision was yet to be made. Akimov, seeing the power spike got out of control, pressed the scrum button, the infamous AZ-5. He did the right thing, as the button should be the last stand of any specialist working in the control room of any reactor of any nuclear power plant around the world. The scrum button was supposed to be an off switch. It should kill the reactor process, which would get extremely costly to reverse, but it was a necessary safety measure in case of a situation like the one Akimov faced on April 26, 1986 occurred. A few seconds later, the reactor exploded. We know little about what happened in the next seconds or minutes. Everything we know about the decisions made is what operators or Dyatlov said, so there is a chance of a twisted view of the step-by-step -step process, especially regarding the stress all of them were under at the time. Dyatlov confirmed that he ordered the water to be pumped into the reactor to cool it down. This was a result of him not being able to even imagine the possibility of a reactor exploding. Next, also confirmed by him, was that he sent two of his staff members to lower the control rods manually. They were previously taken out of the reactor to gain the power when it dropped down too much. Probably that was a decision made under shock, because he later admitted that it was an illogical thing to do. Quoting, If the rods do not go into the position when clutches are de-energized, they will certainly not go when moved manually. Other people present near Dyatlov at the time of the disaster said that he behaved anxiously, he was yelling at his junior staff and it was impossible to convince him that the reactor exploded. That part was portrayed by HBO pretty much accurately, if we totally believe the workers' accounts, that is. And remember a few things. Debating on how to behave in such extreme circumstances is easy when we are not in it, and even easier when we have the knowledge of what happened later. But the situation probably can't be understood by anyone who wasn't present there at that particular moment. Also, remember that the staff were there too, and despite the Atlov's order, or despite lack of the orders, they did make some decisions, they did take some actions. From their point of view, they could be equally held accountable for what happened, especially having in mind they were living in the Soviet Union. This definitely looks like a situation in which a lot of people would try to cover their own asses. I'm not saying their words are not true though. I'm only pointing out that it's word against word case, and we will never know what is true, we can only assume what was more probable than the other. In the previous episode, I've told you also about what Dyatlov's staff and co-workers said about him, so I may say this time that he could be called a controversial person. Some people praised his qualities, others were very negative towards him. As Dyatlov wrote in his book, I never sought to be loved by my juniors or by my seniors. I think that it's enough to be competent and fair to ensure normal working relationships. In any case, none of my staff ever quit because it was impossible to work with me. I could have been too tough sometimes, but nothing more. Indeed, I was demanding. I think it's enough for today. This particular moment, the day of the Chernobyl disaster, is a subject which could cover a multi-episode documentary, so I will leave it here. Nonetheless, that's an important part in the Atlov's story which is essential for what I will tell you in the next three chapters that will appear in the next video. Take care, stay safe, and see you soon.